that wasn't long. I was expecting like something. <laughs> How's everybody doing? We doing good? Yeah, awesome. Good to see you, Bethel. Those who are in person right here in the San Jose campus, those who are streaming and watching on the, at the Santa Clara campus, and those who have invited us into your homes, wherever you might be tuning in. Happy, happy Father's Day to you. Um, my kids are, uh, would, they would be up here if they uh, were in, in, in the house here. So we've, uh, they were in the, what's the, the room called? The parents' room or whatever? Parent, yeah, that's, that's awesome. I'm so glad you guys have that. It's an honor uh, to be here with you all. Uh, we were here in February of 2020 when uh, we voted on my parents to be your new pastors and then everything shut down. So <laughs> it's, been, <laughs> it's been a wild year, year and a half, hasn't it? Uh, but we're excited to, to be here with you. It's an honor. This is a sacred moment, y'all. This is a sacred moment. Do you recognize it? Do you recognize it? Writer and speaker Joyce Huggett wrote, in the stillness, we can shed some of the pressures which would prevent us receiving God's word into the innermost core of our being. We can focus away from the mundane and the everyday and onto God. Such stillness is to Bible reading what preparing the soil is to farming, essential for fruitfulness, essential for fruitfulness. Before we continue with the reading of our sacred writings, the Bible, the Holy Scriptures, I invite you wherever you're at, in person here or streaming in, to silence and stillness. Just for a moment, as we close our eyes, let's close our mouths as well and give ear to the word. King Jesus. Let's just do that for a moment. Jesus, we pay attention to what you're doing right now. Disturb us to our core in the most beautiful and healthy of ways. We pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. If you have a physical Bible or maybe use a Bible on your phone uh, on, on, on the U version or a different type of app or whatever, I would love for you to go ahead and look for, search for, flip to uh, Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. Um, up to, it will be in verses 40 and beyond, but. Um, up to verse 40 in Luke chapter eight, there is a lot of healings going on. Jesus is kind of crossing the Galilee, uh, the, the Sea of Galilee or Sea of Tiberias. He's kind of going around and healing people. And then he goes over to one of the sides of the land of the Gennesarets and he does something crazy there. And then he comes back over uh, to another side of the, the sea or the, the, the big lake. And that's kind of where we find ourselves uh, here in Luke chapter eight, verse 40. If you are there, go ahead and say, I'm here. Okay, if you're ready, say, I'm ready. ready. All right, cool. That, you guys are fast flippers or searchers. That's awesome. Okay, so we'll begin in verse 40, Luke chapter eight, verse 40 through 42, and then we'll pick up the rest of the story a little later. Verse 40. Now, when Jesus returned, he returned to where he was, the crowd welcomed him for they were all waiting for him. And there came a man named Jairus, who was a ruler of the synagogue in that area. And falling at Jesus' feet, he implored him to come to his house, for he had an only daughter about 12 years of age, and she was dying. She was dying. I'll never forget the phone call. My wife and I were waiting in line to, the, to enter the variety show at the Paris Resort Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas because you always got to check a show out or the, at least the Bellagio, uh, whatever those things are, fountains at, in Las Vegas. Um, you got to do that. And so we're entering the, the variety show and Ashley was about four months pregnant with our second and the doctor's office was calling. My wife picks up 
and she was given news that would turn our world upside down. You're going to have a boy and we give him about a 60% chance of Down syndrome. And there's no telling how severe at this point. Have you ever been there? Received some unexpected news? Been given an unpleasant diagnosis? Walked away from a hurtful or difficult or deceitful conversation? Took in a look at the news lately in our world? Taking a stroll, taking a stroll through Twitter or any kind of media outlet. Have you been there? Put on your first century glasses or goggles for just a moment as we get a little nerdy. Let's get a little nerdy. I would imagine that is probably what Pastor George Negretto looks like when he was a little younger, just a little younger. Is that mean? That's mean. Oh, anyway. Yeah, we're going to get a little nerdy uh, together. I, 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 feel, I feel like uh, Pastor George is a little nerd like myself, so that's fantastic. Um, the Israelite culture and society is tribal in orientation. It's tribal, as was most of the ancient Middle East, meaning that the family is literally the axis of community. One of the things that this meant was the most important information about any individual person within ancient Israel was the identity of their father, their gender, and their birth order. Okay, we see this with uh, the, the, the 12 sons of Jacob. We see this all throughout ancient uh, literature as well, not just within the scriptures of the Bible. So, so to be a patriarch of a family with zero children meant not only that you cannot pass off the family inheritance to a direct uh, descendant, it also meant that protection, future protection and current protection and lineage as a whole was in jeopardy. It was in jeopardy for a woman, for instance, to be barren, for a wife to be barren in ancient society was considered a travesty. Not just because you didn't have children, but because it affected the, the family. For, for years to come. We see echoes of this with Abraham and Sarah. We also see some of this with Ruth when, uh, when uh, Naomi, the, the mother-in-law of Ruth, her husband and then her sons die and she is basically left widow. She's, she's completely at the uh, mercy of whatever the, uh, the area, the, the culture is where she's at. She, she has nothing, she's lost everything. So she wants to go back home. Okay, we see this with Ruth. We see it with Hannah. We see especially with Zechariah and Elizabeth. Zechariah and Elizabeth in uh, Luke chapter one. There's echoes of Abraham and Sarah there. It's a beautiful parallel that, that, they, that we have there. Okay, so, so here in Luke chapter eight, we have a father instead of a mother. We have a father who had one child, a sixth grade girl, most likely getting ready to be married off. Okay, this was his lineage. This was the future. This was the, 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 uh, the future of his family. Okay, probably getting where, ready to get married. All his hopes, dreams for her, for the family, all the desires and plans he had for her to marry her off, unite his family with another family is hanging in the balance as she lays on her deathbed. Can you imagine, can you feel the agony and desperation? He swiftly approaches this young, popular rabbi, Jesus. Now, does Jairus love his daughter outside of cultural and patriarchal reasoning? We get the picture that he does, absolutely. We get that picture as he comes to, to Jesus. Okay, but my desire is for us to see the major social and familial pressures and ramifications of your only child getting deathly sick, deathly sick. It meant it was huge. It was a big deal. So let's go ahead and step into the shoes of Jairus as he takes and leads Jesus to his home. Okay. We'll keep reading. This is verse uh, 43, uh, 42, the end of 42 into 43, okay? Luke chapter eight. As Jesus went, as Jesus went, the people pressure, uh, pressed around him. They pressed in and there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years. And though she had spent all her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. It means she was probably pretty wealthy. 
In verse 44, she came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment and immediately her discharge of blood ceased. And Jesus said, who was it that touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, master, the crowds surround you and are pressing in on you. Respectfully saying, are you crazy? <laughs> but Jesus said, someone touched me for I perceive that power has gone out from me. And when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him, declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. She takes the same posture that Jairus took, falls down before Jesus. And he said to her daughter, your faith has made you well, go in peace. While he was still speaking, someone from the ruler's house came and said, your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher anymore. But Jesus on hearing this answered him, do not fear, only believe and she will be well. And when he came to the house, he allowed no one to enter with him except Peter and John and James and the father and mother of the child. And all were weeping and mourning. They were probably, they were probably hired by the way, hired mourners for her, but he said, do not weep for she is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. That's how we know they were probably hired. <laughs> you don't go from crying to laughing like that. And like, ah, ha, ha. Well, anyway, uh, they laughed at him knowing that she was dead, but taking her by the hand, he called saying, child arise and her spirit returned. And she got up at once. And he directed that something should be given her to eat. I love that Jesus says, hey, you hungry? Let's, let's get her some, uh, some cheese and some bread. I love that. He cares about all of, all of it, all of our needs. And her parents were amazed, but he charged them to tell no one what had happened. So about a week or so after that Las Vegas phone call from the doctor. We, we visited uh, the doctor's office for uh, a routine ultrasound. They were monitoring our, our baby boy a little, close, a little closer than usual. We were optimistic and began preparing our hearts for this gift of a child being graced to us when the nurse was a little uneasy during the, um, during the ultrasound. Didn't wanna say anything to us, got up and left. The doctor came in about five, 10 minutes later, tears in her eyes, distressed, but direct and compassionate towards us, said, your son has a condition called high drops. I'm so sorry, he will not survive this. We would not know when, we would not know the timeline, it would be uncertain, but outside of the miraculous, we would lose our second child. The walk, to our vehicle after that news. The drive home, it all felt like an eternity. I wonder if this is how Jairus feels as he walks to his home. Is this how he feels? Okay, picture the scene. Father Jairus leads King Jesus, his ragtag group of followers, weaving in and out of the, of the crowd. Come on, let's go, let's go. We know that Jesus never hurried anywhere. You look at the scriptures, you look at uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus has a way about himself. He's always on time. He doesn't, he's not, oh my goodness, he's not frantic. He never hurries anywhere, okay? He's got a way, he's never too hasty, but always purposeful, always on time, always determined. So as the crowds pass him, what's the dad doing? Let's go, Rabbi, right? My daughter, my daughter, my only child is lying on her deathbed. Can you pick up the pace, bro? That's what I'd be saying. Dads, right? We're dads in here, right? We're dads watching. Pick it up. <laughs> Move your feet. Jesus pauses. Someone touched me. Oh. And you're trying to be respectful, right? because this is a popular teacher, Jesus. Not only is he popular, he's starting to say some really cool things that we've waited and waited and waited for that have been prophesied for thousands of years. And this could be it. So you don't wanna like mess up the Messiah, like, you know, relationship with you at that point, right? But seriously, really everybody touched you, <laughs> right? 
course, let's go, keep going. No, 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 someone touched me. Imagine the power struggle. You have a synagogue leader, probably the elder of the synagogue. So it would have been a very respected man. And then you have this respected rabbi, chief elder, who touched me. This is so good. This is so good. Jesus then, after that interaction, she touches Jesus, the hem of of her garment. It's not who touched my clothes, who touched me. What does Jesus do? He enters the house, preteen, pronounced dead. He reaches down towards the deathbed and what? Takes her by the hand. Child, arise. So easy for us to move past this too quickly. In one fell swoop, the doctor, the physician, Luke, tells us that Jesus is touched by a woman who is bleeding, probably menstrual hemorrhaging, and then he touches a corpse. Both actions instantly makes Jesus ceremonially unclean. Both. Heaping double pollution upon himself, and he does it anyway. He knows. He knows you don't touch a corpse. He told the story, the Good Samaritan, right? He doesn't, he doesn't get mad at the Levite and the priest for walking on the other side. He just points it out that how much different, how, how different the Samaritan responded. Of course they walk on the other side. If you know the story of the Good Samaritan, if you grew up in church, they don't wanna be ceremonial and clean. What happens with Samson in the Old Testament, the judges? Samson touches a, uh, he grabs the, the lion's jaw that's dead. Makes him unclean. Jesus does it anyway. He does it anyway. I don't know your story. I don't know your story. I don't know where you are in your walk with Jesus. Those who are tuning in, those who are right here in the house. I, I don't know all the different misrepresentations of Jesus in Christianity. You might've been told things that lies that you've even, maybe even believe about yourself. I don't know the pain, the hurt, the struggles you continue to face, you faced in the past. But I do know this, that King Jesus is never outside the reach of broken humans. Never outside the reach of broken humanity. When he is present, everything shifts. Everything changes. The messiness of your life does not intimidate him. He's not scared. He's not taken off guard. He's not like, oh my goodness, really? He's not, he's not any of that. It doesn't matter your past. It doesn't matter your background. It doesn't matter your family origin. It doesn't matter how dirty or unclean you feel or have been told you are. It doesn't matter how dead you feel inside. Jesus is in the business of restoration, bringing dead people to life. There's new life for you. There's new life for you in Jesus. There's restoration life available always. Will you choose to reach out? This woman that was bleeding, remember Jairus, let's hurry it up, Jesus. She reaches out in faith that even if I just touch the hem of this garment, knowing what she's doing, this is a rabbi. That's why she's so scared when she comes up to him. Uh Uh-oh, I'm in trouble. What did I just do? Will you choose to reach out to him? So often, so often in our hurt, in our pain, in our discomfort, in our dissatisfaction, we choose to do the opposite. We run away from Jesus. But to what, G.K. Chesterton says? What? Where are we going? Run to him. Reach out to him. Allow him to grab a hold of your life. Follow him, surrender to him. This is not just for those who are contemplating Christianity, those who might be just checking things out, checking out this Jesus. This is for everyone. This is for everybody. The ever prophetic Eugene Peterson grabs a hold of the human condition when he says the Christian is a person who recognizes that our biggest problem is not achieving freedom. That flies and that's kind of countercultural. But in learning service under a better master, the Christian realizes that every relationship that excludes God becomes oppressive. It becomes oppressive. Yeah. And, and I'll add to it, 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 it enslaves us. 
Everyone has a master. Everyone has a master. Jairus understood this. He got this. And he did, what he did was so profound. It was powerful as an individual, but also for us dads to look at this dad and to see what he did first and foremost. It's critical, it's critical for us today. Here's the truth. It's right out of Luke chapter eight, verse 41. He said, he, 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 he bends his knee. He bends his knee. So real power, real leadership, real manhood looks a lot like falling at the feet of Jesus. That's the truth. That's the truth. Dad, that's the truth. It, it looks like approaching Jesus and falling at his feet. Our world is desperate for men, young and who are man enough to invite the presence of Jesus into their homes as Jairus did. And to bend the knee in submission to his authority and his authorship, not just anybody, he's the best master. He's not just a better master, he's the best. He's the best. Our society, they don't even recognize. There are people you go to work with week in and week out that they don't even realize this is, this is the answer. This is important, primary, number one. How different our world would look if followers of Jesus would do this. If you knew my middle son, you saw him up here. I have to do it every day. <laughs> Jesus, help me. I just fall at your feet. <laughs> If Christian, thank you. <laughs> yeah. If Christians would get this, we need to get this. We need to recognize this, how different our world will look. So what does that kind of look like? Uh, really quickly, just uh, three critical ancient practices for dad, okay? Just some real practical. I'm just, and this isn't just for dads, but it's Father's Day, and I want to specifically talk to dads because we set the tone. We can set the tone here. We can set the tone with our kids. We can set the tone with our families. We can set the tone with our, at, our, at our workplace. Um, uh, and so three critical ancient practices for dad. First is prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting. It's a, uh, it's a, the way I'm talking about it with fasting is an abstinence of substance. It's the easiest way to kind of say that, to remember it. An abstinence of sustenance. Sustenance, okay? So it's abstaining from what sustains us, food, food and drink, right? So I challenge dads, start a fast with your family or, or with your wife or with a, a friend or a group, or your small group, okay? Uh, uh, do, do a meal a week, do a meal or, or a day a week, do a day or two a month. I fast every Monday, I fast Sunday night, uh, sundown to Tuesday night, sundown. Uh, once a month, do it once a month. I just started it this year. It's awesome and it's terrible at the same time. <laughs> I'm Italian, man. I like food, right? So, so prayer and fasting. Uh, man, read, we don't have time for this. Read the book of Daniel. If you haven't done this yet, we live in Babylon, y'all. Okay? And so read the book of Daniel and fast. Fast as Daniel did, Okay? Pattern yourself a little, your fasting and your prayer with Daniel, with Daniels, okay? It's, it, it's a fantastic read for us today, culturally. I've got resources for you also in your um, outline, in your outline. So you can look at those and there's, there's resources for you to, to read on. Okay, so that's prayer and fasting. And then table talk, table talk. That's a, the second ancient practice. Sharing meals together around the table is identity forming. It's how, it's how we form identity, okay? So have a meal together. We try and go four times, uh, we try to do four dinners a week. Just our schedule's a little crazy, but we try and sit at the table and we read scripture together. We talk about our day. This is a no phone zone, by the way. Get rid of the technology, okay? And you know, you got, you got the one kid, or my oldest, he, he just, he finishes his food really fast and wants to get excused. So no, you have to sit here now and stare at us while we eat the rest of our food. So, <laughs> so anyway, so, so I, we try to be around the table four evenings a week. Um, if you can do more than that, that would be ideal. Uh, sometimes we get five or six a week, but, but get around the table, table talk, hang out together, be together. And dad, make sure you're there too. And not just, not just in our headspace too, that we're, we're there. That's my thing. I'm, like I come home and a lot of times I'm thinking about 50 different things. 
You know, mom and dad, both of us, I mean, we're just a lot going on, but be there, be present. And then intentional apprenticeship, intentional apprenticeship. Jesus modeled this. Okay, it's modeled throughout scripture, but uh, dads, automatically, this is your children and my children. We are the primary disciplers of our kids. There are plenty of other people. There's plenty of other things and shows and media that would love to disciple your kids. Okay, but we are the primary ones. Now there is community and it's good. Get plugged in here. If you're not plugged in here at Bethel Church, get plugged in. You don't have to go at it alone, but we are the primary disciples of our children. And then in addition to that, who are you walking with? Who are you walking with? Look around you. Okay, think about it. Who could be somebody you can pour your life into? You can do life together. You can walk with together. Grandpa, what young man can you walk with and pour your life into and listen to and ask questions and invite over for a barbecue and go to coffee together and ask them about their story? And we, can, we need grandpas walking with young men. We need single uh, young adults that are looking around and see the single moms that have children that we can walk with their young boys together and just and help them with, with their walk with Jesus and answer questions. My kids have all kinds of awesome questions. Have you ever just sat down with a five-year-old and just said, hey, talk to me, what's going on? Well, you know, Jupiter, you know, it's just, it's awesome. Sit down and listen and talk and walk with, play, shoot hoops, okay, with the kids, that type of a thing. Get involved, young men, get involved. Who is your one? Who is your one that you're walking with? Again, there's online, there's resources in your outline uh, that you can, you can look to, to to read up on these three things. Um, about three weeks, three weeks later, uh, after the di- doctor's prognosis, uh, the heart of my son, Ezekiel Ray Silveri, would cease beating. I can't quite explain it. But Jesus has never felt so near to me and my family. Yeah, in this case, he didn't in this life grab the hand of my son and say, arise. And in this case, he didn't. But as a father, I was gently reminded years later from what I can only explain as a Jesus whisper. Sean, your son is completely restored. Today he dances and one day you will be reunited. And you see, that little whisper was all all I needed because it reminded me of of hope. Reminds me of hope. This is the hope that we have as Jesus followers. Whether Jesus chooses to enter in and intervene in whatever situation right now that you are asking him to intervene in, as I did as a father, or whether he chooses to to let the cards play out. Whatever the case is, we have hope as Jesus followers. We have hope in Jesus. I don't always understand while some are healed and restored here on earth, I don't always uh, understand why some aren't. I'm not sure why that is, but I do know this, that the narrative of scripture from beginning to beginning, Revelation's a beginning, guys, not the end, from beginning to beginning, consistently reminds us that this is not home, ultimately. This is not it. It's not everything. I don't have all my chips in this bank. Okay, I don't. This isn't home. There's hope beyond this life. There's more than just what we see in front of us today or on the six o'clock news. There's more than this, okay? My friends, where have you placed your hope in? Where have you placed your hope in? I didn't place my hope in the healing that Jesus could or would heal my son. I placed my hope in, the, in who he is, his character who he says he is, knowing that he knows what's best. Where have you placed your hope today? To whom or what have you bent your knee? 
any master outside of Jesus Christ cannot deliver on their promises and will only end up enslaving us. Only Jesus, only Jesus can bring the satisfaction that you are looking for. Today is a great day to bend your knee to King Jesus. It's a great day to do that. I'm gonna ask everyone to bow your heads, close your eyes here in person and those who are watching, watching online. If you've never given your life to Jesus, if you've never given your life to Jesus, you can do that. And he'll answer a simple prayer. You just say, Jesus, I give you my life. I bend my knee to you. I submit my life to your authorship. Write me a brand new story. I want you to be the master, the leader of my life, the authority. Reach out and grab for him. And he'll answer that prayer. Say something simple, just a simple prayer. Something like that. He will answer. For the rest of us, Jesus, help us to daily be reminded of Daddy Jairus who came and fell at your feet. You are our strength when things are up and down and all around. You are our sustainer. You are our joy. You are joy and love and peace and grace incarnate. It's not some feeling. It's not some emotion. It's not something abstract. It's concrete and it's found in you, Jesus. So help us to continuously come to you, to lay ourselves down before you, to pay attention and to listen. Jesus, help us. We pray for all the dads. Help them with these three ancient practices, this challenge, Lord. Maybe there's some other ancient practices or different things that pop up. Lord, may they fan that flame. May they go, go forth with those, those plans and those thoughts and those ideas. Help our dads, help our moms, help our families, help our children, Jesus. May you draw them all close to you and near to you. In Jesus' name, we pray these things, amen, amen. Thank you, Bethel Church, love you guys.